Hi everyone. So in this week's lecture, we're going to talk about threads and multitasking within our programs. And we're going to start this lecture by exploring some of the background theory regarding uh, multitasking, concurrent programming, and uh, how that differs depending upon architecture and operating systems. And uh, then we're going to go on to have a look at how we can create threads within our C++ programs uh, using the Windows API, which of course may differ from other operating systems. So this lecture will be specific to Windows, um, but at another time we can explore some of the differences between Windows, Mac and Linux systems and how we can make use of the uh, system resources there. And uh, then once we've uh, covered how to create threads within our C++ programs, we're then going to go on to have a look at some common synchronization issues which can occur when two or more threads are trying to access or write to the same location, uh, whether that's a file or a variable or an object or some kind of resource. And uh, we're going to explore some solutions for resolving this issue, some different approaches. And uh, we're going to focus in on the mutual mutex function uh, for resolving this particular issue, which by the way stands for mutual exclusion. That's what it's short for. And uh, we're going to have a look at how that approach can successfully lock access to one thread at one time, preventing other threads from accidentally overwriting the work of other threads. Okay, so we'll explore that more in detail later on. But for now, let's start with some background on threading and multitasking. And when we talk about multitasking, we need to make an important distinction between process-based multitasking and thread-based multitasking. Now, process-based multitasking does allow two or more programs to run at the same time like you might well have two or more applications open at the same time. And yes, it's true that each process or program can have more than one thread. However, the performance of this differs from a single core architecture to a multiple core architecture. Whilst it appears on a single core architecture that these threads or these processes are being run concurrently, Technically, because there is only one core, one brain, if you like, that can only give its attention to one thing at one time, any sort of concurrency that is perceived is technically rapidly switching between these processes. Okay, It appears that things are being run concurrently. Maybe that's threads within a program or different programs running at the same time. But the CPU is only allocating its resources to one application or one thread within an application at one time. And therefore, if multiple threads are being run within an application, then the CPU has to switch between the threads rapidly to give the appearance that concurrency is taking place. But on a multiple core architecture, each one of the cores can be assigned a different thread. So therefore, a program that has more than one thread, say this might be blocks of code allocated to a thread, can be given to one of the multiple cores to be executed simultaneously at the same time as other threads being executed on other cores. So we're not limited to just one core, which can only execute one thread in series, one after another, basically, and just rapidly switch between them to give the appearance of multitasking. True multitasking is achieved by having multiple cores and then giving them dedicated threads to execute simultaneously to other cores that are also executing a different thread at the same time. Okay, and of course, uh, we're living in a time where most architectures now are multiple core, so that can enable true concurrency, uh, which makes our lives a lot quicker and a lot easier. So it makes sense to learn how to write our programs to take advantage of uh, running different threads and allocating different blocks of codes to different threads. So let's go on now and have a look at the advantages of doing this. 
And so one of the main advantages, as you've probably already worked out from the previous slides, is that true multitasking and multi-threaded programs allow us to make use of CPU idle time. So rather than having to wait for the CPU to complete one task before moving on to the next one, uh, we can actually run the two in parallel, meaning that we don't have to wait around for one to complete. Um, it used to be the case that printing uh, would freeze the interface until the printing was complete. Therefore, we wouldn't be able to do anything with the interface, when we had to run any other programs until the printing had finished. But of course, that isn't a problem uh, these days because with multiple cores, uh, we can delegate the printing operation to one of those cores to be done in the background whilst we can proceed with working on other applications. So therefore, the main advantage of multitasking is that we can be more efficient in our processing. Uh, rather than serial uh, processing, we can make use of true concurrent processing, meaning that we can get more done in a shorter space of time, essentially. And another good example of making our programs more efficient using threads would be to apply threads to a network server. And uh, this relates to task two of the assignment for this module, where you have to set up a server that will wait for clients to connect to the server before proceeding with a chat application. Okay, so what we could do in that instance is we could create a thread which would listen out for clients uh, to connect to it. And this can be conducted simultaneously with other threads that perform other operations that are useful to the server. Okay, so we don't have to freeze the application, essentially, to wait for new clients to connect to the server. And this thread could be running simultaneously to other threads that might be managing the data of clients that have already connected to the server. Rather than having to wait for them to connect and then process, uh, we can do those things all at the same time, making our server functionality much more efficient. Okay, so these are just some examples of where we can make our programs much more efficient through using thread-based multitasking. And it's actually only recently that C++ has started supporting multi-threading natively through the creation of a thread class, uh, something which C Sharp and Java have had for much longer than C++. But it was in the 2011 release of C++ that the thread class came about, which now makes it much more convenient to create and manage threads. Before then, to create threads within C++, it required utilizing APIs to connect with the resources of the operating system. And that's actually the route we're going to be taking for the practical this week. We're going to avoid the easy route of using our neatly packaged uh, thread class to create and manage our threads and instead get to know how to interact with the Windows API. So although it will be a little bit more challenging, it's going to be beneficial to get to know how to work at a lower level and how to connect the system resources with our applications. And uh, this is going to be useful, as you might find yourself having to maintain legacy systems out there which use this process, which were created before uh, the 2011 release of C++. There's a lot of code out there, so it's likely that there is software out there still running this legacy version of threading. Okay, so it's going to be useful for maintaining legacy systems. And of course, operating at this lower level does allow us a lot more control over the configuration of creating threads. Okay, that's what uh, C++ is uh, famous for, is going to give us a lot more options for fine tuning settings and configurations, which will hopefully lead to better performance. Okay, uh, as we interact with the operating system at to more lower level. And consequently, because we're going to be pursuing this lower level route of uh, working with the Windows API, uh, we're going to have to get used to working with some more complex data types that are specific to the Windows operating system, as you can see here. But uh, please don't be put off by this uh, apparent complexity, because really all we're doing here is just passing parameters like we've done before when setting 
setting up functions. So all we've really got to do is uh, just learn the formatting of these uh, functions and parameters. So let's have a look at some of these parameters here and uh, try and demystify what they mean. So let's start with the first parameter of this create thread function, which is LP security underscore attributes. And uh, if we have a look at the next slide here, we'll see that we've got a helpful description for this particular attribute as well as the others. And um, here the security attributes is just a pointer to another attribute that controls the access to the thread. So if we wanted to allow any security permissions to certain resources within the operating system, uh, we could point towards the appropriate uh, attribute which will allow this. And uh, if we want to uh, restrict access as well, we can also do the same with a pointer of this type. So um, in this particular example, we're just going to use the default security settings. We don't need access to any um, restricted information or privileged information of the operating system. So we're just going to set this to null for this example. OK, so that's the first parameter. Uh, let's go and have a look at the next one now, which is size underscore T, uh, which refers to the size of the stack. Uh, now, we briefly mentioned the stack in previous presentations when talking about creating static objects on the stack as opposed to creating our dynamic objects on the heap. And uh, we're actually going to be exploring the differences between the stack and the heap in the next presentation when we look at memory management. And we'll have a look in more detail then. But uh, for now, what this refers to, this parameter here in the create thread function, is the size of this stack uh, allocated for this application. So um, we can actually set this within Visual Studio. I think its default is one megabyte. Uh, but here we get the chance to actually uh, configure that and uh, set the size for that. And um, if, we're, if we're not going to be changing the size of the stack allocated for the application, uh, we can just write zero in this uh, parameter here. Uh, that doesn't mean the stack is of zero size of zero bytes, uh, but instead it just says accept the default size of the stack that's been uh, set up already. All right, so as we're not going to be changing that in our example, we're just going to write zero there for that uh, parameter. Okay, so let's go on to the third parameter now, which is of type LP thread underscore start underscore routine. And uh, in our code example, we're passing the name of the function. And uh, notice there we haven't got the call operator, the parentheses afterwards. So we're not calling that function. We're instead passing the name of the function, which uh, hopefully you remember from the previous presentation. The name of the function contains the address of the function. So we're passing the address of the thread function that we want to create within this create thread function itself. So this create thread function will create uh, the thread function which then holds the implementation uh, for the thread. So therefore this is going to be a way of providing the address of the function in which to start the thread. So this is going to be the name of the function uh, which holds the implementation of the thread itself. So start routine providing a, an address to start the thread. Let's now go on to the fourth parameter which is of type LP void. And uh, we're going to see an example of this in the following slide. Um, in this particular slide, we're actually passing null to the argument of this type. But this is where we would pass uh, parameters. So if there's a particular object of a particular class that we uh, need to get access to uh, in order to print details or call functions on, we can actually cast it to this LP LP void type, which basically acts as a generic type. Uh, any other specific type can be adapted to this generic type, this very base uh, type here, uh, so that it can accommodate for any particular specific type. 
uh, so that we can then use the data of an object or call functions of a particular object within our thread. Okay, so LP void basically is a generic type uh, which can accommodate for any specific uh, user defined type or even primitive data type that uh, is a type of variable or object that we want to pass into our, our threads to use the uh, data of that particular variable or object. Uh, great, let's now go on and have a look at the fifth parameter in the list, uh, which is of type D word. And this represents a flag uh, indicating whether we want to start the thread immediately or not. So by writing zero here in our example, we're just stating that we want to execute this thread immediately after it's been created. Now let's go on and have a look at the final parameter in the list, uh, the sixth parameter, which is of type LP D word, another type of D word, which we've just seen in the previous parameter. And uh, you'll notice here that in the example, we're also setting up a variable of type D word here, thread ID. And uh, we're actually going to pass the address of this thread ID to the create thread function as the sixth parameter here. So this will enable the create thread function to assign an integer value for this thread ID, uh, useful for numbering the different threads that might be created, especially if you can have more than one thread. It's useful to know the IDs uh, for each one of them so that it can be managed easier. So this is just what the create thread function will do for this particular parameter. Okay, and uh, the final thing to mention is that the create thread function itself actually returns a value which is in the type of the handle data type. Again, another Windows data type here. And you'll notice in the example, we're just creating a variable HDL, uh, abbreviation for handle of this type handle, so that we can capture the particular value that's going to be returned. And again, this is going to be a unique identifier for the thread so that uh, we can then refer to the thread through this handle. Okay, so hopefully that covers the basics of the create thread function. Uh, let's go on now and have a look at a basic implementation for setting up a thread. And here in this slide, we're going to define the implementation for the thread function itself. So if you have a look at the blue box here, notice that we have set up a function for our thread, which is called basic thread. And within that function, we're just going to output a message to say that we are starting the thread. Uh, and then we're gonna ask the compiler to pause. We're gonna ask it to sleep for 2000 milliseconds, or in other words, uh, two seconds, and then uh, output a message to indicate the end of the thread, and then uh, return zero. So it's a fairly basic thread just to get us started, but uh, note here that we need to conform to the signature for thread functions. Uh, the return type has to be of type D word win API, so we've got D word again, and uh, we've got an explicit reference to the type win API, just to make it clear that uh, we are indeed working at that low level. And then the function itself, the thread function, has to take a single parameter of type LP void. Remember, LP void is uh, one of the most generic types. So uh, we can pass anything to our threads. We just have to cast them to this LP void type so that any type is indeed passable and we don't therefore have to conform to a specific type. All right, so we're gonna have a look at that in a few slides time. But uh, before we go on to have a look at uh, passing parameters, let's just get this basic example working. So let's put uh, the create thread function together with the definition of the thread itself, the thread function together. And uh, if we have a look at this slide here, Notice in the main, this is the main of the application, this is where we're going to set up the particular attributes uh, for the thread. Uh, and just to skim through those again, uh, remember the first attribute, the first parameter that's going to be passed to the create thread function is going to be the security attributes. So as we don't want to change those, we'll accept the defaults and just pass null. 
And then the second parameter is uh, zero. That's referring to the stack size. So this doesn't uh, set the stack size to zero. That's just saying accept the default size. We don't want to change that. Then the third parameter is the name of the function. Remember that the name of the function holds the address of the function. So we want to pass the address rather than calling it. Um, so that's basic thread uh, in line with the basic thread thread defined above the main, which we're going to come to in a moment. Okay, and then uh, the fourth attribute is uh, we're going to be passing null here, and that actually refers to any parameters that we might want to pass to the thread. Uh, in this instance, we're not going to be passing a parameter, so uh, we'll put null there. I think it's in the next slide that we actually do pass an object of a class, so we'll have a look at casting then. But uh, let's leave that null for now. And then next, the fifth parameter in the sequence, zero, uh, that refers to the execution of the thread. So uh, as we want to execute this immediately, we're going to pass zero there. And then finally is the address of thread ID. And remember, that's a local variable that's set up of D word type um, for which the create thread uh, function itself will just assign an integer referring to the ID. Okay, so that's a quick summary of all the different attributes there, all the different parameters that are going to be passed to the create thread function. And uh, let's have a look at the basic thread itself now. So cast our eye up to the top where we have got the definition of basic thread. Uh, its return type is dword win API as it is required to be. Uh, name of the function is basic thread and it's going to take a single parameter of lp void type uh, we can't actually change this uh, there's no overload for this without parameters so we need to uh, conform to this lp void uh, type even if we uh, don't pass anything in even if we pass null as we are going to we still need to state a parameter of LP void type as we have done here. Okay, but uh, then the thread itself is just going to do uh, what we said previously, where it just outputs a message to say it's starting, and then after two seconds, it's going to end. And then the return zero statement, of course, like normal functions, just terminates the function. And then, well, in previous cases, it would have returned execution back to where the function left off. But uh, as we are aiming to perform this concurrently with other code, we're just going to stop that sequence of code execution, which shouldn't affect the sequence of code execution in the main. And so the thread itself is created on that line in main. So that's where execution splits. It would be serial up until that point. But then processing power is given to the thread, which, uh, depending on the resources and the current load of the operating system, that may start uh, before or after the next line in main, which is system pause, which should just output that to screen. So it does depend upon other variables of the operating system as to whether that uh, thread will be starting uh, after or before this uh, next line in main. However, the execution will eventually split there and uh, that thread will run in parallel with the code within main. Okay, so if you were to code this up, uh, you should see that taking place. All right, so I hope that makes sense in terms of getting a basic thread up and running. As we've been hinting at for a few slides now, let's go on and have a look at how we can extend this further by passing in a specific object so that we can make use of particular information and make it relevant to our programs. And so if you have a look at this slide here, notice how in main we're creating a dynamic instance of a game object class and uh, we've created an object called obj. And then in the create thread function call in main, notice there the fourth parameter, which was previously null on the uh, previous slide. Um, we we're actually casting this game object obj to lp void it's an explicit cast because we've stated lp void within a pair of parentheses uh, next to the obj object itself and notice there's no space there 
meaning that we can then pass the object into our basic thread, which comes in the form of LP void. So we now have to cast it back to a local object uh, of type and of structure game object, the class. So notice there we're setting up another dynamic instance of the game object class, where we are then casting the param which is the local version, the casted version of that uh, object we passed in back to a game object so that we can then uh, invoke any member functions or refer to any data of that particular object. And also, because the signature specifies only one parameter, uh, remember that there are no overloads for the thread function. There's no overload for uh, no parameters or no overload for two or three or four parameters. Uh, if you find yourself wanting to pass multiple values, it might be a good idea to actually wrap them up within an object of a class, because remember you can refer to multiple data members through an object. So as you've only got one parameter, it'd be better to pass an object here um, as you're not able to pass multiple uh, primitive type values in the uh, parameter list uh, provided here for create thread. Okay, so in summary, if you want to pass in objects of a particular class uh, to your threads, remember that you have to cast them to the LP void generic type. And then within the thread itself, you have to cast it back to the specific type. So whatever class structure that it was initially created of so that you can then uh, refer to the data members and member functions of that object. And uh, there are also lots of other functions that can help us uh, manage and better control the execution of our threads. And um, depending on the scenario, it may be necessary to suspend a thread temporarily uh, before subsequently resuming that thread. And uh, we're going to talk more about the scenario where uh, different threads are trying to access the same resource. And therefore, if they're both trying to write to the same resource at different times, that could cause synchronization issues. So we're going to explore uh, that particular scenario furthermore um, in a little while. But uh, likewise, there may be other situations where you want to temporarily stop a thread executing, maybe to free up resources or to prevent uh, other changes is being overwritten and uh, you can do that by using uh, functions which are handily named after uh, suspend thread and resume thread. Uh, the only thing perhaps to note here is that they require the handle that's created by the create thread function. Remember that returns a handle, a bit like a unique identifier of the type handle itself, the low level uh, windows type there. Um, and so we just have to pass that to the corresponding function to suspend and then subsequently resume the thread uh, when it's time to do so. Okay, and uh, we can also prioritize threads. So admittedly, it's becoming less of an issue now as uh, there's a lot more headroom for processing power uh, with multiple cores. Um, it's perhaps less of an issue to prioritize um, threads because there is so much more processing power available now. But still, I suppose there are scenarios where we're running at uh, close to capacity. So we may want to prioritize certain threads over others. And um, so we can actually make use of these constants here, which you'll notice uh, range from uh, priority time critical to priority idle, okay, and uh, these just have integer values attached to them as uh, constant variables here, so ranging from positive 15 to negative 15, and uh, we can pass these in to the set priority class function, um, as well as the uh, handle, the unique identifier for the thread to um, better manage and uh, organize the running order of our threads, because we want to give more time to the threads that are the priority, and uh, therefore the other threads which are uh, less of a priority can be executed after the higher priority ones have finished. Okay, so Hopefully that gives us a good introduction to setting up basic threads. Um, let's go on now and have a look at some synchronization issues and uh, how we can resolve them. 
So far, we've focused exclusively on the benefits of concurrent programming and multitasking with delegating different blocks of code to different threads so that they can be performed simultaneously uh, in parallel with each other. However, uh, there are some drawbacks to this technique when the threads are trying to access and write to the same resource. Let's take the example of two threads trying to open the same file at the same time. Now, they can probably open the file at the same time and read in the information from the file. However, if that information is stored locally in each thread, then if they want to make different changes to that file, they're going to be operating on the same local copy and not seeing each other's updates. Now, this is a problem that's been resolved in uh, cloud computing. Let's say when you have a shared file uh, that can be operated on at the same time by different users, where the users are accessing the same location. They're not creating local copies of it and then uploading it. They're accessing the same location in parallel with all the other users and the uh, central location is keeping track of the changes made by the users uh, at the time that they're making them. But coming back to our example where let's say we have two threads reading in the contents of a file and storing the contents in an array, say, for each line of the file might be an element of the array, which is a, a very typical way of reading in the contents of a file. Um, the problem is that as each thread makes changes, they're making changes to an independent copy of the file rather than viewing each other's changes. So let's say that thread one makes a change to the, let's say the first line of the file and saves it. The problem is that change is not recognized by the second thread to make its changes because the second thread is working on a earlier version which doesn't have those changes being made. Therefore, when it makes changes to that file, it will then overwrite the changes of the first thread, which made its changes in the first place. And so that's just an example of a synchronization issue that could be caused with two threads or more accessing the same resource and making local copies of them to then change them. And therefore, it may be necessary to restrict the access to a particular resource to one thread at one time. If two threads or more are trying to access the same resource, then a way to prevent these synchronization issues would be to only allow changes to be made one at a time. So we're gonna have a look at an example in a moment where we can employ a basic locking mechanism so that only one thread can make the changes and the other threads that are trying to access the same resource are suspended or put on hold essentially until the first thread or the thread that's currently making changes uh, has finished making its changes, updated the state of the resource and then releases the hold of the resource so that the other threads can then have exclusive access and make their changes uh, one at a time. Okay, so let's have a look at the next slide now where we see an illustration of this. And uh, notice here that we have three threads and within them, we've got the same locking process being applied, which checks to see whether the value of a flag variable, which uh, can act as like a true or false um, option. Uh, in this case, we're using integers because we're setting the value of flag to one to mean that we are now locking the flag. It's true, in other words, that we are now accessing and modifying the resource. And once we then have finished doing that, we can then reset the flag to zero or false, in other words, um, so that other threads can then uh, come in and also make changes and then lock the access to this particular resource so that the other threads uh, are not able to make changes. And whilst this seems like a good idea in principle and would work in principle, there, there's an issue in terms of how this is outworked because there's a time delay between the process of checking the flag 
and the process of actually assigning the value for the flag. And if we have a look at this step by step, we come in on the left hand side, the first red arrow. And let's just say for the sake of argument that uh, Fred 1 is going to be the highest priority and the first Fred to run in comparison to the others. Let's just use that as an assumption. Let's say that the first Fred to access this resource comes in and then locks the resource, setting the flag to 1. Uh, so that the other threads are not able to access the resource, they are locked out, they are uh, suspended temporarily. And then let's say that the first thread makes its changes and uh, then releases the lock on the resource, it resets the flag to zero. And at that point, that means that the other threads, which are trying to constantly check to see if they can access this resource, uh, now can. Okay, so here is where both Fred 2 and Fred 3 can now get access to this resource. And so let's imagine that both threads, let's say they're on separate cores and run at the same pace. Let's say that they both check to see whether they can access the resource at the same time, which they can. So therefore, they both come into and then try to lock the resource and they might do that at the same time as well, <laughs> which means that uh, we're not able to block the other thread from accessing this resource because we've, we've got both of them trying to access it in parallel because both of them checked and the resource was free. Therefore, they both came in and may have well then tried to lock the resource. Uh, possibly one may have beaten the other to do that. It really depends upon the uh, processing of the course. Um, but I hope hoping what you're seeing here is the problem is the time delay. The locking mechanism works, but it's the time delay between checking to see whether the uh, resource is available and then locking it. So ideally, what we need is a process that can both check and lock the resource at the same time. Now, to do this, we're going to need to make use of some special functions provided by Windows at a lower level, as uh, our standard C++ higher level syntax uh, isn't able to combine both the looping facility and the assignment process. There's no way to actually do those two things within the same step. And so, once again, we're going to have to turn to our low level Windows API to provide the capacity for checking and also locking the resource. So there are different types of what is known as a synchronization flag or otherwise known as semaphores. And uh, here we see four different types. There's a standard semaphore, which can restrict the access to a resource to any number of threads. And there's also a mutex semaphore, which restricts to one thread. We're going to be going down that route, as well as an event object, which acts as a signal for when an event has occurred, and also weightable timers as well, which will block threads for a specific time. And uh, we'll then release them after that time. But as I say, we're going to be going down the mutex semaphore. Remember, mutex stands for mutex mutual exclusion, meaning uh, that it's either one or the other. So this is otherwise known as a binary semaphore, as opposed to the uh, counting semaphore, uh, which is uh, for any number of threads where it can be more than two options. Whereas with the mutex semaphore, it's either one or the other. We can only have one thread at a time, and uh, the access will either be on or off, true or false, essentially. So let's have a look at the create mutex function then which performs in a similar way to the create thread function, like we had a thread function that we defined and then the create thread function, which returns the handle for that. We have a similar process with the create mutex function, which takes uh, slightly less parameters, should be said, than the create thread function, but will return the unique identifier for the mutex, uh, which is then assigned to a global object, which uh, we're going to have a look at in the full example. Uh, but for now, we're just going to concentrate on the create mutex parameters, which are similar, albeit less than the create thread function. But we do have the same initial parameter, 
which is the security attributes. So I think in our example, we're going to leave this as the default settings. So we're going to pass null to that. And then the second parameter is a Boolean for the acquire attribute. So this refers to whether we want to lock the resource immediately upon the creation of the mutex or not. So if we pass true, it would do that. However, if we pass false here, that then allows other threads to come in and then lock uh, the access to this resource. So basically, it depends upon whether we want to limit the access from the very start or whether we want to wait for the first thread to attempt to try and access the resource to then uh, lock it and then change it and modify it and then release the lock later. And we're going to have a look at the function that enables us to do this in just a moment. And then finally, the third parameter refers to the name of the mutex. And you'll note here that it's not the string data type that we're well accustomed with. It's actually this LPC string STR um, type. So that's a lower level type. Um, so we just have to cast the name of our function to this type. Okay, so we need to have an explicit cast there and we'll see that in the following slides. All right, so this is what we do to create the mutex and then like the create thread function that returns a unique identifier in the type of handle, uh, which is gonna be useful later uh, so that we can manage the mutex. So we'll come on to that. Uh, let's now have a look at the next slide which refers to the function that will simultaneously check to see if access is available to the resource and then lock it if it is available. So this is the wait for single object function. And uh, when we call this, we have to pass the handle of the mutex, the mutex object, which we'll see in a moment. And then also the time that the thread is willing to wait until it has access to the resource. So if it's not immediately available, then we can specify how long we're willing to wait. And uh, whilst this comes in the form of the D word type, uh, this does translate to a series of uh, constant integers that specify a integer amount of time corresponding to the number of milliseconds uh, that the thread is willing to wait or this in this case the mutex is willing to wait before it will return time out um, and again that's in a form of constant there um, if it cannot access the resource after the specified time uh, in the example we're going to look at in just a moment, we're going to pass the infinite constant. So basically just wait until it becomes accessible, no matter how long that takes. However, here we can also set up uh, custom time lengths to say, well, if it's not going to be available after this time, then we'll move on and do something else. So we get that control there as to how long we get to wait for it. Okay, but uh, assuming that the first thread that wants to access the resource can, it will then come in and lock access to the resource and then we can perform the changes that we need to perform within the thread. And then finally, once we've made those changes, we just then need to release the lock on the particular resource. So therefore, there's a function for this called release mutex. And uh, we can pass the handle of the mutex just so it knows which one in case we have multiple mutexes set up for different resources. And uh, then that will release the access to the resource so that other threads can then come in and access them. And of course, this just returns a boolean, true or false, um, whether it can release the mutex or not. So all going well, it releases it. It then returns the value to say that it has released it. And uh, it returns zero to say if it's filed. So it's probably going to turn one uh, if it's true that we can release the mutex. And then for whatever reason, if there's a problem with releasing the mutex, it will return zero. Okay, so now let's uh, put all these functions together to create a full example, which we see here. So looking at the main, uh, we've got the thread ID and the handle for the thread. That's in the last line here in main where we create the thread with all the different parameters. Referring to the security attributes, first of all, that's where we pass null for the first parameter. And then uh, zero for the stack size. Uh, that just means we want to accept the default stack size. 
and then the name of the function in the third place, uh, that's going to be the address of the function, of course. Uh, we're not calling the function, we're not calling this thread, we're just passing the address of the thread function, which is sync thread. Uh, fourth parameter, that refers to any parameters that we want to pass to the thread itself. Uh, we're not passing any parameters in this case, so we're just gonna state null. Uh, then the fifth parameter is the uh, time, whether we want to actually run this thread immediately or not, and by passing zero, that means we, we do immediately execute the thread. And then finally, in the sixth place, the sixth parameter is the address of the thread ID, so that we can then create a unique handle and then return that. Okay, so that's the thread. Uh, at the very top of this uh, code sample here, we're actually creating a mutex name in the form of a char array, and then a handle called hmutex, uh, which we can then use as a handle for our mutex. We're gonna pass that to the create mutex function, which is just above the create thread function call in main. So if we have a look at the third line in main now, uh, this is where we pass three parameters. So remember, this is where we're gonna pass the security attributes again. So we wanna accept the default, so we'll say null there. And then the second parameter refers to whether we want to immediately lock access to this uh, resource. So we don't want to do that. So therefore, we want to say false so that the first thread to call wait for single object can access the resource. Um, so therefore, we're going to write false uh, within our create mutex function call. All right, and then finally, the third parameter is the name of the mutex. So this is in the form of the char array. Therefore, we're gonna to have to cast the mutex name to this low level LPCW string type. Okay, and that then goes to the uh, signature of create mutex, and it generates a handle for the mutex, which is then returned, and we assign that to our global handle attribute at the top there. Okay, so then we set up the mutex ready so that the sync thread, uh, which we see in the middle there, uh, remember the uh, syntax for that, we just want to return D word when API as the return type. We have to say that and we pass null to the LP void parameter. But then the first statement within that thread is where we call the wait for single object function. I remember that requires the mutex handle, which we pass in. And then the second parameter is referring to how long we want to wait to get access to this resource. Uh, in this case, we're gonna pass infinite so that we wait indefinitely. Basically, we're blocked until we have access to this. And uh, if there's no other threads attempting to access this at the same time, we can come in and we can lock access within that statement. Uh, and then we can perform whatever changes we need to make to the resource and then finally we release the mutex that's where we pass the handle again so that we can release the lock so that other threads can come in and uh, make changes if they want to and then we just finally return zero to terminate the thread okay so hope that makes sense in terms of setting up the mutex uh, probably best now that we have a go at uh, creating this for ourselves. So I think here would be a good point to transition into having a go at some of the exercises for this week. Great, okay, so let's dive into the first exercise for this week. And uh, here we're given the code for creating a basic thread. So let's uh, copy this into our projects. I'm gonna put it above the main function here. And uh, notice here that we're referring to these low level Windows API types. So we're going to need to also include the Windows header file. So let's do that. Let's include that at the top here. Include windows.h. There we go. And uh, that then should allow us access to all of these. There we go, it's just changed now. So there we go, there's our basic thread, which is just going to output a start message and then pause for two seconds and then 
output a end message. So I think if we scroll down, we're also given the code for main as well. So here we go, we've got the thread ID, the handle, creating the thread, and also outputting pause statement, or I suppose that translates to um, press any key to continue. So let's uh, copy that in to our main. I'm just gonna put it underneath here. And let's see now, if we try running this, we should see something resembling the following output here. So let's just check we see that. There we go. Yeah, so there we go. Notice there that we actually started our thread immediately after we created the thread here. So we actually started the thread. Uh, therefore, we see this output first. Let's just uh, have a look here. Yeah, so there we go. We see the thread output first, and then we see the press any key to continue, which is the, the pause here. And then we see thread end. Okay, so that's good. That shows us that we have run this thread simultaneous with the code in main, which is, good, which is a good start. So let's move on now and uh, have a look at the next exercise here, the first exercise, which is warming up. So uh, let's now comment out the system pause statement and uh, run the program again. So there we go. Let's try this and uh, let's see what we see. Ah, okay, so notice there that we don't see anything appear. All right, so that might be because we've we've probably finished the main first because we returned zero, so therefore we automatically close the program. <laughs> so that might not allow our thread to run simultaneous with the main because the main's finished. So we probably do need the main to be active in order to run our threads because it is tied with the program. All right, so just remember to keep main alive. <laughs> it's probably why we got the system pause there for press any key to continue. So it waits for a key press um, so that it keeps the threads running. All right, so just, just remember that when you're writing your programs. Uh, but now I think we're going to start changing the implementation of our thread. So let's do that here. Uh, add a new thread function to your program. So let's copy this in. I'm gonna put it in between the first thread and uh, the main function. So there we go. It looks as if it's just going to output the word threads multiple times, uh, pausing in between each output. So now uh, let's uh, move this line of codes in. And uh, what we can do, we can probably, I'll tell you what, let's uh, comment this out for now. I don't know if we're gonna need to return to it later. So. I'll just put the block comments in here and uh, then paste this code underneath. And uh, let's see if we can run it now and see what we see. Ah, there we go. Notice that we are outputting the thread three times um, there. And also notice that we saw the, uh, the main uh, you could say thread or the main application running in parallel with this. It's waiting for us to press any key, so it's still active. And uh, we repeated that thread output three times. Um, I think what we're trying to do though, is we're trying to create three separate threads, even though they do the same thing. Uh, we're trying to mimic three threads running in, in sequence in a sort of parallel with each other. So. I think the next part of this is to actually do some formatting so that we can see these threads uh, running uh, side by side. All right, so if I now amend the code within message thread, let's uh, replace this with this. And I think if we try running this again, we should see a very different output now. Oh, and I need to finish this. So let's do that. Let's run it again. Aha, now notice that we've got uh, the numbers corresponding to which thread that we're running, and we actually see them uh, running 
in parallel now. So we actually get a feel for which thread runs first and uh, how they are worked out side by side. And it looks to be fairly even at this stage. I think it would depend on the other resources of the operating system. So notice here, actually, it's a bit different now. We had thread two and three running simultaneous with each other. And notice there, thread one gets all the processing at the end. So I think every time you run this, you should see a slightly different coordination there. So let's just run it one more time, see if we see any difference. Oh, there we go, a bit more uh, even there. Okay, so I think what we're going to do now is we are, if we move on and uh, try some priority, actually. Yeah, let's try copying this now into the main. We're going to try and set the priority for each thread so that we change uh, which way around the threads are run. We try and influence the operating system. So let's see if this has an effect. It may vary from uh, operating system to operating system in terms of how it works out. Uh, oh, here, notice now that we've actually had quite a lot of influence on the which on the resources that the thread <laughs> gets access to. So notice here, we set that uh, the thread, second thread in the in the array to be time critical. So notice there that got it got to run first, and then uh, the lowest thread is next. It's actually a slightly higher than idle. So that got the attention next, the final thread, thread three there. And then the first thread, uh, because it was idle, the lowest of the low priorities, that got uh, the less, that got the last access to the resources. Okay, so this does um, actually work on, on this specific time, on this specific machine. Um, this is actually, I think this machine is a multiple core machine. So it may vary from run to run on how the operating system allocates which thread gets the time. Uh, notice here it's, it's also being consistent again, but uh, I think if you see some variation there, that might be because the operating system has a lot of headroom, therefore it can allocate the resources evenly. It doesn't have to prioritize one over the other. Um, that would be a different case on single cores, obviously, where there is limited processing power, but on multiple core recent machines, that might not be such an issue. So you may see some variance there, depending upon uh, how many other applications are running <laughs> side by side with this, as well as um, what machine that you're on, the specification of the machine. But at the moment, you can see it's fairly consistent. It's giving its resources to the highest priority and uh, then allocating resources to the other threads as they get less and less of a priority so that we always perform the higher priority threads first because they're most critical and then the idle threads and the lowest priorities are last to get access to the resources. Okay, so have a play around with that, see if it varies depending on how many other applications are open and uh, try different machines. And then why not have a go at the rest of the exercises here? It's quite generous, we've been given a lot of code here. Um, have a go at creating some mutex functions and playing around with those and see if you can lock access to the resources. And uh, yeah, give that a go and uh, see how you get on.